2007, Governor Ted Strickland created the position of the Governor's Energy Advisor through Executive Order 2007-02 and appointed Dr. Shanahan to the position. In that role, he's responsible for the coordinating state agencies' efforts to develop a comprehensive Ohio energy policy and to implement the governor's order to significantly reduce state agency energy consumption. Mr. Shanahan oversees the work of the Ohio Coal Development Office, one of the nation's leading clean coal technology research development and employment programs. Since 1994, he has served as Ohio's clean air ombudsman for small business. He's the he is also the government's delegated representative on the Third Frontier Commission and active member of the Air and Waste Management Association. He just com completed a term as a group coordinator for the Technical Council's Environmental Management Group. Dr. Shanahan earned his PhD from Case Western University. He received his master's degree with honors from the University of Pennsylvania and graduated magna cum laude and phi, phi beta kappa from Boston College. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me Dr. Mark Arshan. Well, thank you all very much, and uh, thank you to President Chandler for inviting me to participate uh, in this event. I really appreciate it. Uh, we had a really uh, fascinating discussion of the panel laying out some of the challenges uh, that we face. And I'd like to try to take that and, and put it specifically in, in an Ohio context. Uh, and do that in terms of uh, changes that have occurred in the last almost three years that have significantly altered uh, the, the energy horizon in this state and how we try to move forward on it. Uh, in November of 2005, a uh, congressman from Southeast Ohio, a coal country congressman, uh, decided he was going to run for governor. And interestingly, his first policy paper in that campaign focused on advanced energy. And I think most people looked at it and, and assumed it would be coal and nothing but coal. And if they read it carefully, might have been surprised to find out what the breadth of, of Congressman Ted Strickland's vision was at that time. Because he put that out there, uh, energy became a topic in the gubernatorial campaign, and it was something that both candidates then had to talk about as they went around the state. And doing that, I think, um, demonstrated that the broad vision really did have a foundation here in Ohio. <clears throat> Uh, that in fact uh, there was an enormous amount of activity and interest in advanced energy technologies across the state uh, and there was a significant amount of innovation taking place. Why does that matter for a state like Ohio? We are one of the largest energy using states in the country. And we are particularly <coughs> dependent on our use of electricity. Uh, we regularly rank about fourth or fifth highest consumer of electricity in the United States. Uh, to put that in a global context, there are only 18 nations in the world that use more electricity annually than we do here in the state of Ohio. Only 18 nations use more electricity than we do. And we have taken access to that electricity and to, more broadly, other energy sources and built an economy upon them. Think about some of the key pillars of the Ohio economy. Uh, manufacturing. Uh, despite its setbacks, still employs 800,000 people in Ohio uh, with good wages and good benefit packages for their families. Our manufacturing is disproportionately centered in high energy use portions of the manufacturing sector. Uh, we do a lot of work with metals, with plastics, with chemicals, and with glass. It takes an enormous amount of energy to do that. Second pillar of our economy, uh, agriculture and food processing. Uh, we are one of the few places in the United States uh, where farms uh, raise crops and animals in very close proximity to the plants where that food is processed, which are in turn close to high population centers. 
that industry is incredibly dependent on energy, uh, electricity, and petroleum based uh, to keep functioning. And a third uh, major pillar of our economy, because of our geographic location, is distribution and logistics. We have historically built our economy around being a supply chain state. And what that means is lots of feedstocks come in, lots of component parts go out. And if the transit of that material is not taking place in and out of Ohio for our use here, uh, because we are within an overnight drive of 60% of the U.S. population and 80% of the Canadian population, uh, much of what this country produces and uses to produce it uh, goes through Ohio at one point or another, uh, by road, by rail, by water, by air. Uh, obviously, an energy-dependent uh, sector. Uh, when the governor took office, uh, as you heard, in, in the first two weeks of his term, his second executive order was to create the position of an energy advisor. But far more importantly than that, he created a mechanism uh, through which we would attempt to build a comprehensive and coordinated energy strategy in the state and coordinated energy programs. Uh, why did we need to do that? Well, I made a reference to this earlier. Uh, much like the rest of the country, uh, in the mid-70s, we understood there was a serious energy crisis. We created the Ohio Department of Energy. And by 1983, we also decided the energy crisis was over. It was never going to come back again. We didn't need that kind of focus on energy, and we disbanded the Ohio Department of Energy and scattered its programs across state government. Uh, so that today, in a state government that has 27 cabinet agencies, there are probably 14 that have some energy program in their purview. Now, some of those are huge. Some of those are, are agencies like the Public Utilities Commission like the Department of Development, which have major focus on energy. Everybody can identify those. But some of those are very small. Uh, Department of Commerce has the State Fire Marshal's Office. What's that got to do with energy? Well, the State Fire Marshal regulates propane and fuel oil storage tanks along the Ohio River. And those are tanks that are used about four weeks a year uh, to bring in uh, the first shipments of heating supplies for most of Southeast Ohio for the winter, and then it gets distributed. How the fire marshal regulates those plants for that four weeks of usage uh, can determine both availability and price of that fuel oil or propane. And so we have a lot to try to wrestle with. Uh, because the governor also believes in leading by example, he also ordered us to get a 5% reduction in state agency energy use uh, in the first fiscal year of his term and a total of 15% uh, in, in the first four years. Um, that, that presented some fascinating challenges for us. If anybody here has worked with an institution of any kind or size and tried to figure out how to get energy efficiency and conservation, uh, you know your first challenge is figuring out how much you use. And uh, if we have 27 cabinet agencies, there are at least 30 different ways to track energy use uh, within those departments. And some people can tell us how much they spend on electricity and how many cubic feet of gas they use. Some can do the reverse. Some know just how much they spend. Some just know how much they use. Some don't really know much of either. Uh, and, and so we said, OK, well, we're going to go forward and we're going to set up a system to begin to collect that data. And we're going to deal with the fact we have multiple feedstocks for energy. We're going to translate it all into BTUs and then figure out BTUs per square foot, pretty standard measure of how much energy you use. Uh, who knew state agencies measured square feet differently? <laughs> they do. Um, it turns out there's a reason for that. Uh, if you own the space, you count every possible inch. If you're leasing the space, you count as few inches as you can, uh, because that's what the rent is based on. And we lease an enormous amount of space around the state. Uh, so we've, we've taken on that challenge. In terms of energy policy, the first major policy that the governor had to deal with uh, was the re-regulation of the electric utility industry. In 1999, Ohio, along with much of the rest of the country, went down the road toward deregulating the electric utility <coughs> industry. And the concept, when it was done in 1999, uh, was that there was a competitive market at the wholesale and retail level just around the corner, and competitive markets always get you better prices, and so we should deregulate and take advantage of that, and we began to do that. Uh, Ohio, in that case, was a fairly early adopter. 
Uh, unfortunately, after we adopted it, a number of things happened. Uh, predominantly Enron, uh, the collapse of the uh, California electricity market for a whole set of complicated reasons. 9-11, uh, and people's view about electricity changed. Most states stopped moving down the road uh, toward deregulation. Ohio, at the end of its first five years, was supposed to, that was supposed to be our transition period, move through that, and then we go to market. At the end of the five years, the Public Utilities Commission sat down and said, competitive market's not here. We need another transition phase. We need to go until 2010. And so as Governor Strickland took office, it was time to figure out if that was going to happen. Uh, the experience of other large industrial states in that time period who went from a regulated electricity system to a deregulated system was to see price increases of 40 to 75 percent. Uh, that was not something that Ohio could bear. And so the governor said it's absolutely critical we revisit that. We don't think competition has developed today. We have to go back in. We have to restructure how the Public Utility Commission works and make sure that that commission, as the representative of the public, still has a vital role in figuring out what electricity should cost our state. A good position to take and one that most people agreed with. But he said, we need to go beyond that. Ohio is behind the curve. When we started looking at that legislation, 25 states had adopted renewable energy <coughs> portfolio standards. So a requirement that their utilities advance renewable energy technologies by having to supply electricity from those sources. And he said, Ohio needs to take advantage of that. We have to catch up. We have to begin to build an energy strategy for the 21st century. But we have to do more than renewables. Uh, we have to recognize the reality of Ohio's energy position. And that is, in the electricity field, 87% comes from the burning of coal. And I think, as you heard on the panel today, that massive investment in that in infrastructure is not going to go away overnight. Uh, no matter how much you think we should move away from coal, it's going to be with us for decades to come under the most optimistic scenarios of a quick transition. Uh, in addition to that, we face the problem that our coal plants are already there. We've got more than two dozen plants, mostly on the Ohio River and on Lake Erie, that are in place. Uh, in many cases, they're 40, 50 years old. Uh, they are producing incredibly cheap power because they're paid for. Uh, and they now can continue to operate with modernization uh, with a much better return to the utility company that owns them. Owns them. They're not going to walk away from that. We have to take into account what we already have. So we have to include advanced coal, clean coal technologies as part of our portfolio standard. If you're really concerned about climate change, you cannot ignore the one base load provider of electricity that has no carbon dioxide emissions, and that's nuclear. That has to be on the table to be discussed. And there are other technologies, fuel cells, uh, biomass. We have to explore all of those. Uh, in uh, 2007, we went to the legislature, and the governor said, this is what I want to do. Uh, but he also has another a mantra that he used in the campaign. He uses it sometimes to drive us all crazy, uh, about how we develop policy. Uh, first principle is live within your means. Second principle is invest in what matters. So what does that mean for electricity? Living within your means translates to more focus on efficiency and conservation, but particularly efficiency. Because we are such a large user of electricity, we are also, in fact, a large waster of electricity. And there has not been an economic incentive because our electricity has been cheap. We think those days are over. And now there are better economic incentives, but we need to drive that market. So the governor announced his idea to begin the formation of a new energy compact for Ohio. And step one would be, would be demonstrated through this new re-regulation of utilities. Make sure we have affordable electric rates and reliable electricity, understanding that we have an old distribution system. Uh, we are blessed to have very good access to the transmission system for what we need today. We may need to expand it in the future. The distribution system is, is aged, and it's showing uh, signs of the fact that it was designed uh, to deliver less electricity than it does today and lower quality electricity 
than it's called on to deliver today. Uh, think about uh, all your gadgets at home and uh, when you've got them all plugged in and there's that little blip in electric power and you have to waste the next half hour going around resetting them all. In our manufacturing sector, uh, that exercise of resetting things can shut down a factory for an entire shift or two shifts as every machine which has computer controls has to be reset to deal with that brief blip in electricity. Reliable uh, electricity is, is critical. And affordable rates. The days of cheap electricity are over, the days of cheap energy are over, but it still has to remain affordable in a state that is that dependent. And then he said, but we have to go beyond, and we have to have an advanced energy portfolio standard that by the year 2025, 25% of electricity sold in Ohio will come from advanced energy technologies. That whole array that I described before, from advanced clean coal, nuclear, fuel cells, biomass, and a raft of renewables. At least half of it, 12.5%, needs to come from renewables. Uh, partly because we have to diversify our feedstock, and partly because as a supply chain state, we need to take advantage of the fact that we make the parts and pieces that go into those technologies, or at least we have the potential to make them. Uh, today, Ohio is already the second largest supplier of component parts uh, to the wind industry in North America. Uh, we literally believe that there are tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs that can be protected or created by making those component parts. We also make component parts for advanced clean coal technology. We make component parts for nuclear technology as well. But at least 12.5% of the renewable, ha uh, the energy in advanced has to come from renewable, and at least half of that has to be built here in Ohio. A lot of people look at that and they say 12.5%, that's not a lot. If you look at what are now 29 states that have a renewable energy portfolio standard, uh, we rank about 20th in terms of how strong our standard is. Uh, but if you look at how many megawatt hours we are going to have to produce from renewable energy. We have the third most aggressive renewable standard in the country. When we went in and talked to the legislative leaders, President Harris and then Speaker Houston, we're very clear about one point. We're going to pass a bill that addresses rates. We will not pass a bill that has anything in it about an advanced energy portfolio standard. We'll be glad to study that for the next five years, but we're not putting that into legislation today. Uh, the governor uh, created a coalition uh, in which he was able to stand up and make his announcement about the details of his proposal, uh, standing uh, flanked by uh, the Ohio Manufacturers Association and the AFL-CIO. Uh, there are very few press conferences that the Manufacturers Association and organized labor attend together. Uh, they stood there along with our university system and said, these are resources we need to use better, more wisely, and into the future help develop. Our resources are tremendous. That bill passed. Uh, the PUCO is now finalizing the rules to, uh, to get those standards into place. How can we meet those? How can we meet those incredibly aggressive standards? And I left out the, the energy efficiency standard. We put that in the bill too. Uh, so that by the year 2025, 22% uh, savings in energy use through efficiency measures incredibly aggressive standards. How do we do that? We take a look at the resources Ohio has and we redefine what a supply chain state is. When we talk today about a supply chain, uh, supply chain state, we think in terms of component parts of machines, and that certainly is part of it. But we have a much broader supply chain history here in Ohio, uh, from the inventors and the innovators who develop the technologies, from the universities who research how they can be built into commercial scale, or from the entrepreneurs who invest in their early deployment, to the skilled workforce that can then go ahead and make them and maintain them and service them. We have those resources here and we have to make the best use of it. We've started to do that. Uh, a few months ago, Rolls-Royce Fuel Cells of North America announced that they were placing their our world headquarters uh, here in, in Ohio, uh, in Canton, at Stark uh, Tech College. Uh, I had the opportunity to go up and visit with the company, uh, with the Lieutenant Governor, uh, right after they made the announcement, and we went in, and the President of the company was there, and we said, uh, okay, this is tremendous, the ribbon's been cut, you're gonna do this. Why'd you pick Ohio? 
and he said all the right things. He liked had this third frontier program that's invested in fuel cell development. He gave us a really good economic incentive package and we appreciated that. So we came here and we said, okay, you're welcome. We're glad you did. Why did you come to Ohio? <laughs> he said, the reality is we're coming out of the research and development stage. We're looking toward going into full production. And what we need in full production is a metalworking industry. And when we look at Canton, what we see all around us is a metalworking industry that's been in place for more than 100 years. You've got the companies and you've got the workforce that knows how to do that. We're going to have to teach them to work with different materials. We're going to have to teach them to meet different specs that re we require. But we don't have to invent the industry. And that's a reason to build here. I think you're seeing that around the state in, in different regions with different strengths. You see enormous uh, focus on solar energy in Northwest Ohio. Why? Because it's the home to the auto glass industry. Uh, all of those skills and materials can translate over uh, into solar energy. University of Toledo has done a fantastic job of figuring out how to make that transition and out of the University of Toledo work and their incubator uh, have spun a number of companies including uh, what is now the largest uh, producer of thin, thin film photovoltaic cells uh, panels in the world for solar. I'm sorry, in North America. Uh, in Miamisburg, Ohio, up near Toledo. Uh, there are three other companies that are on the edge of new technologies, new advances in the technologies of solar. Uh, you see enormous attention paid to the wind industry in Northeast Ohio. And I'm simplifying this because you find this all over the state. But again, because of the component parts supplier network that's there, uh, you see enormous potential to supply those component parts to the wind industry. Move down into Southeast Ohio, uh, not surprisingly, you find a lot of attention on clean coal technologies. Uh, that's what they know, uh, is what supported the region for decades. They're investing more to make sure they don't lose uh, that economic value. Keep going around, get down to southwest Ohio. You see an incredible concentration in the greater Cincinnati area in green design and green building. Uh, a lot of architects and engineers focused on sustainability, rethinking how to build buildings so that we can be more responsible about our energy use. It's a specialty in that area. Start to come up the western side of the state, you get to Dayton. Uh, Dayton has an enormous amount of research going on in propulsion because of the location there of Wright-Pattison Air Force Base, the University of Dayton Research Institute, and trying to think through new fuels. We talked about that a little bit in the panel. New fuels that can be of use to the military. Why is Dayton a great place to do that? Because Wright-Pattison Air Force Base is where the Air Force Research Lab is, and all fuel for the military begins its certification and qualification process at Wright-Pattison. And so they're the ones who get those first lab samples and try to figure out, will this work in our different equipment? How do we test it? How do we prove to all our original equipment manufacturers uh, that, in fact, we can move forward on this? And then scattered around the state, you have fascinating interest on biomass, particularly in the agricultural area. Uh, everything, everywhere from gasification to biomass, anaerobic digesters. Uh, to take what is now a waste product, an expense to the farmer, and turn it into a source of energy. An enormous amount going on. How do we try to keep track of it? It's pretty hard. You know, in most states, you go and you say, well, okay, where's the university that does your energy research? And most of those states will tell you the one school in their state that does that. We have 15. 15 research universities that do significant work in energy R&D. They all have their own specialties. Uh, if you've worked with large universities, you know that at the bigger ones, it's hard to figure out what's going on on the campus, let alone have them talk to other schools about what they're doing. Those universities came together in early 2007 and formed the University Clean Energy Alliance of Ohio. Fifteen university presidents signed an agreement that they would begin to cooperate on their energy R&D and work hard to share information uh, and get the information out to investors to the business community about what happened on their campuses. And they moved forward. I was in a lot of the early meetings and I said to them, well, what about, you know, what about all the other schools in the state, whether they be public or private? What about the two-year colleges? What about the four-year colleges? What about a liberal arts school? 
And I have to tell you, the universities were riding their high horse at that time. They said, no, 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 you don't understand. We're research institutions. And uh, that's a different level than what they do down there. Um, so we're not going to invite them in. We're just going to be the research institutions. Uh, two years later, they have now realized that when they went out and talked to the business community, what they heard was two things. One is, first, yeah, it's really great that you can invent the technology and prove it works in the lab, but once I get it, who makes it work? Who maintains it? I need people with the technical skills to keep the machine operating, whether it be a wind turbine or a solar cell on my roof or a new way to develop clean coal technology. I had to have somebody who knows how it works and can maintain it. Who trains those people? And now they've started to take a look at the other issues involved. We touched on a lot of those today, whether it be economics, politics, marketing, whatever. There's a lot of innovation going on at liberal arts schools around the state. Those have to get involved. And so the University Clean Energy Alliance of Ohio is now reaching out to those institutions uh, to bring them into the partnership. We have other resources in the state we have to make use of. Uh, some of these do, in fact, take a look back into the 70s when, when energy technology and renewables was a high point of focus. We have the Na NASA Glenn labs uh, up around Cleveland. What's that got to do with renewable energy? Well, in the uh, mid-1970s, NASA Glenn was one of the centers of research on wind energy technology in the United States. Uh, and as a result of that, NASA Glenn today has one of only two wind tunnels in the United States uh, that can replicate icing conditions as part of their wind tests. If you want to do wind turbines in the Great Lakes, which a lot of people do, you have to solve the problem of icing, both for the turbine and the blade. And then you have to worry about the force of the ice on the towers. Uh, NASA Glenn has a resource that is almost one of its kind in the nation to do that. We have to pull the resources together, and we're trying to do that. But we have uh, added to the Third Frontier program. It had a large focus on fuel cells for years. We've added a complete advanced energy package to that, and over the last couple of years have invested $150 million in advanced energy technologies through the Third Frontier program. Uh, we had a state stimulus program before there was a federal stimulus package, and the governor put in that $150 million for advanced energy. Uh, we were talking earlier, I was saying, you know, the legislature thinks they've, they've given us an enormous amount of money to play with. As you heard today, uh, that may be true from a stewardship perspective, but in the energy technology field, $150 million is nothing. Uh, but we have that available to us, and we're starting to make use of it. We have it for coal and all the other advanced technologies as well. Uh, in, the, in the past two years, since January of 2007, uh, my agency, the Ohio Air Quality Development Authority, has issued one and a half billion dollars in bonds uh, to help support clean coal technology at Ohio utility plants. So there is an enormous amount of investment going on. We still face enormous challenges. Our use of energy and the fact that it has been accessible and cheap has given us a leadership position in a number of areas some of them not enviable. Uh, we lead the nation in sulfur dioxide emissions, in nitrogen oxide emissions, in mercury emissions, and we are number two in carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, that is still an enormous challenge for us. And I think it's going to take a really united effort by a partnership of all the resources we have in the state, combined with what I was talking about on the panel in terms of education of the Ohio public and beyond about what use of energy means. And when you turn that switch on to think about what do we really want out of this? How much will it cost and who's willing to pay? I use one example. This is something that I think now is pretty broadly accepted, that we should control mercury emissions from a power plant. A lot of mercury in some coals, it gets out into the environment, it gets right into the food chain. It's one of the reasons why there is no river or lake in Ohio that does not have a fish advisory <coughs> warning you about how much fish you can eat within a year uh, because of the mercury content in a lot of those fish. Uh, I don't know if, you, if, if you've seen the Rhodes Tower in Columbus. It's a state office building. It takes up about a quarter of a square block. It's 40 stories. We want to control mercury emissions. 
fill that building with ping pong balls. And in the middle of it, mix in between 20 and 100 red ping pong balls. All of the ping pong balls together represent the emissions from a power plant. The red ping pong balls represent the mercury you have to capture. That is not an easy challenge. And you can capture 75%, and you can do that within a certain economic framework, but if you want to get that last 25%, it's a lot more expensive. So we have to think about how do we do it, who pays for it, and how long will it take to get us there. So the bottom line is sometimes I leave discussions about climate change. I was sort of on the edge a little bit in the panel, ready, ready to just go home and say, that's it, we're doomed, we can't fix it. Uh, there's nothing we can do. But I don't really believe that. I think there are solutions. We need to move on them more quickly than we have in the past. It's a challenge we have to take on, and we have to be successful in it. Uh, and to do that, we're going to have to call upon our political leaders uh, to have vision and to take bold steps. Uh, I think the Obama administration in its campaign certainly suggested that's what they were prepared to do. Uh, you can then take a look at something like climate change legislation and debate whether or not you think they've done it in that piece of legislation. Uh, but the only way political leaders move to that kind of bold vision and action is if we push them. They don't do it on their own. They don't get out there by themselves. Uh, so the work that gets done at the grassroots by organizations, the education that gets done in colleges and universities is absolutely critical uh, to us solving this problem. And that's why I was so excited when uh, President Chema called me and told me what this first uh, seminar of the year was going to focus on. It's an absolutely essential issue, and we need all the help we can get to figure out the solutions. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's be sure if you're just going to pick the ones who would be bad questions. Or <laughs> well, actually, uh, there are still some questions that have been prepared by some of our Garfield scholars. So if uh, those Garfield scholars would like to raise their hand, I will uh, give you a uh, prior place. Um, also, two of the guests uh, on our panel, Dr. Cercio and Dr. Vargas, uh, remain with us uh, this evening. Uh, and I think that I recognize most of you as having been present at the panel as well. So if your questions are such as you might call for a response from them, as well as, uh, as Mr. Shanahan, uh, I think you're going to remember the second one, right? Um, all right, so questions? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Dr. Shanahan, I did some research on the Ohio Air Quality Development Authority before I came to the seminar, and I took a look at the Advanced Energy Portfolio Standard under Governor Strickland's energy plan, and took a look at the renewables, which was municipal waste or garbage. And then I was trying to research coal gas station gasification and plasma gasification. And I saw that under the coal development, you had a lot of coal gasification programs, but I didn't see anything relating to plasma gasification programs. I may have missed something, but I didn't see anything under the agenda or the many programs you have of research and development with colleges that related to that. So I was wondering why you chose to exclude that from your program. Yeah, we, we have not done work in um, accepting gasification. Uh, and the reason for that, frankly, is that that is the expertise that we find in Ohio universities, for the most part, in their advanced research. Uh, there's some work done at, at a lower level, sort of initial basic research, uh, that may include plasma, and there's certainly some in the private sector. Uh, but the program has really tried to focus on the expertise that is in Ohio universities and what the utility companies or other industries that use coal tell us they want to look at at this time. Um, I had to tell you, the, the use of any technology with municipal solid waste is sort of um, experiencing a, a, a phoenix-like reappearance in Ohio. Uh, the initial attempts to use municipal solid waste for energy were, were with incinerators. And uh, the two principal examples are the one in Akron and the one in Columbus. Uh, 
Uh, the one in Columbus, they were both early. Uh, Akron has fixed a lot of its problems. The one in Columbus now is not only closed, it's torn down. Uh, but the one in Columbus, because of uh, the technology that they were using at that time, uh, held a, a brief moment of fame as the largest emitter of dioxin in North America. Uh, and that's an image that was a technological problem at that plant and a design problem. But it's the image that all cities now have about incineration. Um, you know, it's a lot like, uh, for, for some of us, when, when you talk about hydrogen as a fuel, a picture of the Hindenburg blimp blowing up uh, is the image that comes to your mind. It didn't have anything to do with helium as an automotive fuel. Uh, just like a badly designed incinerator doesn't have anything to do with using municipal solid waste as an energy source. Uh, but I think that the bias has been against doing that for a while. And now, for a lot of reasons, largely economic, people are starting to revisit that. So I think you may start to see some, some additional um, uh, attention paid to that. I know the city of Cleveland right now is uh, undertaking a pretty extensive uh, evaluation of uh, moving toward gasification of their municipal solid waste to supply electricity to their public power company. But we have not done any work on it. I'd like to ask. A little bit. Um, how, is it possible to speak about the useful lifespan of the uh, sort of coal burning electricity generated plants that we have in abundance and which you said are now 40 or 50 years old? And if so, is there, are we approaching an opportunity to, uh, as those wear out, to uh, retrofit them uh, in a way that would make use of the new sort of technology that uh, Professor Sessio was, uh, was bringing to our attention? Or is it the case that we are simply not in possession of the kind of expertise that would enable us to move that fast, if that is a fast movement? Uh, and if I may say so, it seemed to me that uh, James Bardis was suggesting that what we do in this area ought to be uh, sort of experimental, uh, that we would uh, develop uh, plants so as to uh, obtain the expertise where uh, probably might make such an investment, but that we're not ready to do so yet. Is that correct? We need to do it. There's very little of this technology yeah. that's already operating at these very large scales. And as you mentioned, <coughs> $150 million is not much in the energy world. And uh, so if we want to see lots of plants, not just in Ohio, but of course the country convert, it would be nice to get that initial operating experience, that knowledge base. And when you get that, you also learn how to save money so that the next plants might be less expensive. I, I, I think a, a large part of the issue, frankly, is economics. I mean, you've got old plants uh, that, for the most part, were, were paid through the rate base under a regulated system. And now companies are looking at those plants. They're fully depreciated. They're largely paid for. Uh, but they're still operational. And they're using uh, a, you know, still a, a good price of coal uh, to generate their electricity. So the question to the utility is, what does it make sense to do with that plant? If I can keep that plant going another 5, 10, or 15 years by investing 20% of its value, and I'm comparing that to the cost of building a new generation station, uh, which at utility scale, if it's a coal plant, is going to be anywhere from one to three billion dollars. Uh, what's the best investment I can make? Now, I think where you're going to start to see some changes is if there are restraints on carbon dioxide emissions, some of the economics change. The best example is First Energy's Burger Station in Belmont County. They were encouraged, if you will, by a, a consent order for, that they had to sign a, under uh, the Department of Justice uh, to get their emissions down. But as they looked at that plant, that's a plant, it's a small plant, it's a nameplate capacity of around 400 megawatts. Uh, it's been there for 40 years. Um, it does not make any sense to try to put more controls on that plant. It's too old, too small to be worth the investment. It certainly is not worth worrying about its carbon dioxide emissions. They had to either close it, decide to invest about $250 million in additional pollution controls, or convert it. 
they, for about $200 million, are going to convert that plant to a biomass facility. And they believe they can successfully make the argument with the US EPA that it will be a carbon neutral generator because they will get their biomass from a sustainable source. That's not something that would have been on the table two, three years ago. And it's mostly because of the economics. We have a number of plants in Ohio that are that age, that size, where companies may decide that it's worth trying to do an experiment at that station but before they ramp it up to a larger one. Uh, frankly, one of our challenges with the US Department of Energy historically has been that they're willing to invest a lot of money in clean coal technologies, but it's for new builds. Um, that's not the issue here. We, we're going to have very few, if any, coal plants being built. We have one that is now beginning construction in Ohio for the municipal power system, uh, an 800 megawatt coal-fired station in Meigs County. They're going to use a control technology that we actually, through the coal office, invested a lot in uh, called, uh, from a company called PowerSpan that they think also has the potential co to control CO2. Uh, but you're not going to see many brand new plants. Our challenge is, what can you retrofit? How do you deal with a power plant that's on the Ohio River and has very little land upon which to build any kind of additional <coughs> control devices? Uh, there's another first energy plant, Samus, where they're investing a billion dollars in pollution control equipment at that plant. They're building a lot of it over the Ohio River. So they're over State Route 7 and out over the river because that's the only place they can put it. They have no land around the plant to put it on. So a lot of it is going to be economics. Other questions? Brian? Uh, when you were speaking about the Ohio portfolio as far as different energy sources, you mentioned nuclear. And if there's another sector of our energy that has a bad rap, especially in the work with, uh, I believe it's Perry's generation station, and the fact that it's never actually been used. How can we improve, especially nuclear, because the cost of building the plants is huge. Uh, how can Ohio actually bring nuclear energy here? Um, slowly. <laughs> uh, it will be a long process, but we actually have begun that process uh, down in southeast Ohio and piped in on an old U.S. Department of Energy weapons facility uh, campus. Uh, Duke Energy and Arriva, the uh, French electric company, uh, have, an, have announced a joint venture to explore putting a nuclear power plant on that site. Now, under an optimistic scenario, that power plant produces electricity in 2021. And that's if everything in the regulatory process goes well. Um, nuclear power doesn't have a great reputation here in Ohio, I think, because of problems First Energy has had. But the reality is there are new generations of, of the technology available. Um, there are still challenges, both for community safety and for disposal of the waste. Uh, I think a lot of these are places where we have to step back and rethink decisions that have been made. So for example, we do not in the United States reprocess fuel rods from nuclear power plants. We need to take a look at that. It, it reduces significantly the amount of waste you have to deal with. And it gets the uranium back in, into a productive state. Uh, I think this number is correct that when, when, the, uranium, when the fuel rod is uh, no longer useful for the power plant, it still has 95% of its radioactivity. Uh, and so we need to figure out the French do it regularly, they reprocess those. Um, they have a little bit more freedom to do that, frankly, than we do because they don't have as public a process reviewing it. Uh, and, and as President Chema can, can tell you, the, the issues of power siting, uh, whether it be from a power plant or a transmission line, uh, are enormous. And we're going through that right now uh, on wind power in the state. Uh, there, there is one deployment of wind power in the state. It's three turbines. It's at a municipal electric company in Bowling Green. There are now several developers who are in the process of developing uh, wind farms in Ohio uh, that will have 100 to 200 turbines. One of the, the first challenges is all of our regulatory structure is set up to deal with very large centralized power generators. Um, we don't have a structure that's ready to deal with one and a half megawatts on a half an acre times 200 spread over 6,500 miles, square miles. Is that one facility? 
Is that 200 facilities? How do you define an electric facility then? How do you, how do you connect that to the grid? And how do you regulate that? I mean, that's what we're, we're wrestling with. And not surprisingly, you know, everybody talks about how great green power is. There's a fair number of people who think it's really great as long as it's somewhere else. Uh, much like a coal-fired power plant, they think they're terrific. They want the electricity, but they don't want to live anywhere near it. Um, so we, we have our first project to go through. It's in Champaign County. They're having their public hearing later this week. It's going to be a total zoo uh, because there's an organized opposition to it. And the opposition takes a number of, of uh, perspectives. One is there's a group of people who very sincerely believe that living near a wind turbine is dangerous to their health, uh, either because of the light flicker or the noise, that it induces schizophrenia, uh, that it does a whole series of things, and they really believe that, and they're going to come uh, testify to that. Uh, there are a bunch of other people who oppose it, frankly, who are farmers whose neighbor got the land lease for the wind turbine and they didn't. They now oppose wind energy in Champaign County because they didn't get the land lease. And you've got a retired banker out there who bought up a whole lot of prime real estate uh, to thinking she would put up $500,000 homes on it. She doesn't want wind turbines near it. So she opposes it because she doesn't want to devalue her investment. So it's a real mixed bag of how people respond to it. Uh, thank you, Brandon, for being the, uh, if not the czar, the connoisseur. <laughs> uh, one of the things I've noticed is that we don't take enough advantage of the fact that we have 50 states in this country to, to do experiments at the local level. And, and while much of what you talked about was with technology or goals, there's also an opportunity to take policy measures. California does this sometimes. And uh, I've been abroad, for example, and see what the Japanese are doing with regard to their efficiency standards uh, for appliances. It's fantastic. They're so far ahead of us in the efficiency of their appliances. They're a television. We get the job. They get the efficient TVs in Japan. And uh, same with building standards. There's an opportunity. I just did a review of the, uh, the government's building standards. Federal government brags about, well, our standards are way ahead. Uh, the code. Well, the code was purposely said to be very, you know, it's a, it's a consensus code. And we found, we found, our, we found that there's a good chance that we can double the efficiency of the average building and still be cost effective. But to me, there's, there are measures that are of a policy nature that Ohio or maybe Ohio or in a neighboring state. They're both pioneers and see how do they work. Uh, I'd like to hear your comments on that. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think, in fact, uh, on, on all issues that now get related to climate change, uh, the, the states have become the learning laboratories. Uh, in the absence of a federal policy, a number of states have started to move in, in various areas. Uh, and we've done a little bit of that. Uh, we, uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago, securitized all our revenue from the tobacco settlement and made about four and a half billion dollars available to local Ohio school districts uh, to build new schools uh, and on a matching basis. And the condition we put on that was, but the new school you, have, you build has to be at least LEED Silver certified uh, to get energy savings, to get sustainability. Uh, and and um, when we did that, when we announced we were thinking about doing that, all kinds of folks came to us to explain why that couldn't be done. And the main reason was, well, we don't have any LEED certified engineers. We don't have any LEED certified construction managers. We don't have any experienced LEED construction firms. So it's not fair. Uh, we thought about that. And we came back and we said, you know what? We're putting four and a half billion dollars on the table. If you want some of it, go get the certification. And lo and behold, everybody figured out where the certification classes were being held. They signed their people up for it. Ohio now has more LEED certified buildings, I'm sorry, LEED registered buildings, than the next three highest states combined. Uh, we're not seen as a leader in energy efficiency, uh, but we are doing amazing things with building. On the regional level, it's different. Uh, 
I, I get to represent the governor to the Midwest Governors Association. Uh, the Midwest has an absolutely abysmal record of states working together. Uh, the same can be, and they're largely the same states, with some of the same can be true of bituminous coal states. We don't talk to each other. Um, Western states get together. Uh, Northeastern states get together. Southern states get together. None of them give up the competitiveness that exists between states for economic development, but they do manage to define common regional interests and then go chase those. Uh, the Midwest has just been awful about that. We've never done it. It's always too hard. Everybody is always too worried about losing their competitive advantage, which these days in manufacturing in the Midwest, it's unclear what that would be defined as uh, anymore given the state of manufacturing. Uh, but I think that's a place where there's enormous opportunity. Midwestern governors just went through this process, and interestingly, bringing in stakeholders. So entrepreneurs, large corporations, small corporations, utilities, research folks, workforce folks, they all came to the same conclusion. It's like, why do you people keep kicking each other? Develop a regional approach. Each of you take a piece of it and try to develop it. So I think the states are doing a lot. Our next challenge is to get to the regional level. At this point in the evening, I'm reminded that uh, Professor Milton Friedman used to take bids as to who got the privilege of asking the last question. <laughs> uh, I won't do that, but perhaps I will announce that we'll take two more questions, as sometimes as the <laughs> lot of us. So people are being able to look at the clock and see that uh, they're part of the very nice. So uh, I know that Diana is one of those with a prepared no. question. No. And it's between five. Okay. First time. No, you can show it. All right. Thank you. One thing you mentioned during the panel discussions earlier today that dealing with environmental issues, be it the energy, like the topic here, or water, is very complex. And we have to look at it from a variety of perspectives. Right? And I agree with you. This is something that we grapple with during the environmental study programs activities we have on campus with our students. Considering the task that you have of overseeing developing the energy policy for the state, if you had carte blanche, what would be the three or five priority policies that you would put in place to make your vision? Well, actually, one of them is something that, that we were talking about at, at, at dinner with President Chumar, and that is on, on electricity. Our, our entire system is, is the result of this argument between Edison and Westinghouse about whether you develop centralized power stations or you develop distributed energy. Centralized power stations, one. I think we have to rethink that. We have to rethink that as our approach to energy, particularly given <coughs> the cost of building new centralized power plants. We have to figure out how we can make best use of distributed energy, put the energy closer to where it's going to be used at a smaller scale. Uh, the second thing is that we have to revisit uh, our regulatory and tax structures, particularly then for our renewables and how they can be deployed, not at grid scale, we know how to do that, but at that smaller scale. I'll give you an example. A lot of folks are interested in putting solar on their roof, uh, but they don't want to do the financing of it. There are a number of companies that will come in and basically put together a lease arrangement with them They'll own and maintain the solar on your roof uh, for 10 years, say, and then it's paid off and it becomes yours. Well, under Ohio tax code, if a third party owns it and effectively is selling you the energy, that third party is an electric utility. And so those solar panels are now subject to elect electric utility tangible property tax. It's the only tangible property tax we have left in the state. Uh, it's, it's pretty stiff but it was designed to tax a coal plant. It wasn't designed for that solar array, so we have to revisit those. And, and the third thing I would do is really push for things that get alternative energy technologies deployed in schools. And the reason I would do that 
is that we need to teach people that these things are not strange, exotic technologies, but they're real and they work and they can see them. Um, I think back to when my kids were in school and they learned about recycling uh, and they came home and drove us nuts at home uh, about how much we did or did not recycle. And so for a lot of us, for whatever reason, we wound up recycling a lot more and it's because it became part of our lifestyle because they argued to us they'd learned why it was valuable. We need to do that with energy technologies too. Diana Salt. Um, in an interview with Foreign Policy, um, Thomas Friedman said the following, I'm interested in knowing the comments uh, He says, I want so many people throwing crazy dollars at every idea, at every garage, that we have 100,000 people trying 100,000 things, five of which might work, and two might be the next green rule. What uh, information technology was to the 80s and 90s, energy technology and music to the early 21st century. And I want you to know your comments about what he's saying, and if there is actually a company or organization out there that is doing something like that. Well, I, I think he's right. That's a great idea. So the question is, where's the money come from? This is particularly a period where that's very hard. We have, we have, I'll give you an example of a, we're doing a loan with a solar company uh, over near Toledo, uh, $10 million to put in production lines for solar panels. They have pre-sold the entire production of both of those production lines to a company in Germany. Uh, they've got the contract in hand. It's ready to go. They could not find a single bank to make them a loan over the last year, year and a half since Lehman Brothers collapsed. So three years ago, banks would have been lined up to lend our money. So right now, it's a challenge of access to capital. Uh, that won't be overcome easily. I think you do have a lot of venture capital out there. Uh, I think here in Ohio, we face a particular challenge is that most of that venture capital goes to the coasts. But we still really are viewed as flyover country. We've talked to people who've had conversations with Coast Venture Capital that says, we don't invest in those zip codes. I think that's beginning to change. Part of it is there's some venture capital here in Ohio, and part of it is I think we're doing a little bit better job at telling our story about what the potential here is. Uh, the other piece of that is trying to figure out what's the role of government in helping with that. The reality is that most research dollars don't come from the public sector. They come from the private sector. And so how do we use relatively limited funds to leverage uh, to get things done and to get those new technologies invented, developed, and deployed? Um, I think we're getting better at that, but it's still a real challenge. Uh, part of it is, is our, our problem in terms of figuring out where we can invest. Um, if I had dollars that I can invest in projects, I think Friedman's numbers about how many of those will succeed are wildly optimistic. I think it's much more likely that you'll invest in 10 and one will work. Uh, that's not a story that I can pleasantly tell to the Ohio legislature. That I took your $150 million and boy, this one project really worked well. And, and we learned a lot from the other failures. Um, they don't think like that. That's not how they approach. They don't think of what research means you're doing stuff that hasn't been done. Some of it's not going to work. They don't want to hear you did that with public money. So that's, that's a constraint on us. The other side of that is trying to figure out what should the government get back for that? Should we just make the investment, see a wild success, and say congratulations, see ya? Or should we have some kind of a co-investment strategy? And in Ohio, that's more complicated by the Constitution does not allow us to hold an equity position in a private company. So we have to figure out some other way that we can bring money back to the state to then reinvest again. Uh, it sounds like it should be easy, but it's actually not easy. Uh, and the final thing, and, and here I'll, I'll slip into some partisanship just because I'm going to do that. Um, we work, we're working in this $150 million. We're working with a number of companies. And you know, they're small, they're entrepreneurial, uh, they have some really interesting technologies. And we've said, well, look, this is part of the state stimulus package, so we're prepared to lend you X, and in return for that, you're going to create some number of jobs. And they go, oh, yeah, 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 we get a proposal, it's going to create 50 jobs. We think it sounds good, we sit down to negotiate, now you're going to sign the legal document. 
think, well, you know, 50 is a little high. Maybe we're going to create 30 jobs. You say, okay, we'll reduce the amount of assistance we're going to give you. Well, that's not fair. <laughs> why, why should you do that? And you say, well, because this is a jobs program. And if you don't produce what you've committed to produce, there's going to be a penalty. Maybe it's a higher interest rate. Maybe it's not all of your loan is forgiven. But you're going to have to pay us back if you don't do what you said you were going to do. And these companies, and because of where they are, I know they're all good, solid Republicans, say, well, that's an outrage. You, you can't do that. Your, your job is to give me the money and let me go do it. It's like, okay, but if you don't create the jobs, I need to get some of it back. And suddenly, that's not fair for government to do. We're not allowed to get a return on our investment of public dollars. And I'm sure I've run into some Democrats who take the same position when it's their company you're talking about. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's, that's a real issue. People don't think of government like that very often. And in advanced energy technology in particular, where we don't have a lot of money, we have to figure out how to leverage it. We've come to the end. Um, I want to uh, express our gratitude one more time to our guests for their thoughtful and useful comments. I think we all realize that uh, some of what they said um, was in competition with some of the other things that some others of them said, and they were very polite uh, to one another <laughs> as to not to bring that right to the fore, so as to have a shouting match, uh, and instead left it for us to think about as is the appropriate way to resolve these issues. Uh, we have a little token of our gratitude. It's a pin, just like some of those that you see uh, members of the Garfield Institute uh, wearing. We hope that you will wear these in good health and where you can advertise the Garfield Institute. <laughs> Thank you.